It's also the time we dismiss our kids, their own time of worship. So if you're a grade school kid in the room, you guys can head on out the back. Let's make some noise for our kids. Let's let them know how much we love them. Let's go. <clears throat> when, we, uh, when we started Church of the Oaks, um, you know, three years ago, a little over three years ago, we set out to start a church that was like founded on, on the word, but like, like in its strategy, we, we, we set out to start a church that was actually going to do the Great Commission. If you've been at Oaks before, every single service, we, we close our service reading the Great Commission together, reminding ourselves of like what we're supposed to be doing. And part of the reason we do that is because like when we got down here and we started talking to people about starting a church, like founded like on trying to actually do the Great Commission, not just talk about it, like not, not do some other stuff, just this is what we're going to do. We're going to walk out the Great Commission together. We started talking about that. I, I started finding something honestly a little bit troubling. You know, something that like resonated with me because it was exactly where I was in the past as well. I started talking about the Great Commission and I started finding that people, like a lot of people, like we believe in Jesus, we're trying to follow him, but we have no idea what we're supposed to be doing, which is a problem, right? I've, I've met Jesus, I've heard about the gospel, I've heard that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, he rose from the grave for me, like I'm forgiven. I don't know what to do now. Um, and there's, there's an issue there, right? There's all this joy, this hope, this security and salvation, this love, but like, He's given some pretty specific instructions to those of us who are his followers of what our lives are supposed to be about. And, and then that means that that excludes a whole bunch of other stuff our lives are not supposed to be about. And without clarity about that mission, you can't live it. You can't live a mission that you don't understand. So I meet a lot of people, myself included in the past, like we, we end up trying to live our lives as trying to be good, nice people, hoping for the best. Okay, I've met Jesus, that's done, right? Now I guess I'm just supposed to be nice and good and like, I don't know, help out at my church. It's not a very, it's not a very compelling mission. I don't, I don't feel like, oh, I don't get like fired up about being nice, <laughs> you know? And like, I don't know, man, I think I'm gonna go to church every Sunday the rest of my life and boom, nailed it. That's not, I don't get fired up about that. I think that's why a lot of Christians lack passion and purpose and drive in their walk is because they lack clarity about the mission. You know, I want my life to count for something. Not because of me and like for all my own glory anymore, but like I've met the king. I want, I want to get to live my life in a way that, that, that put, like, shines the greatest light possible on him. I want to be about his work. I want to build his kingdom in light of what he's done for me. Like, I want to be a part of that. I want my life to count. And I think that a lot of you do too. I think you want your life to count for something. Even if you're not a believer, even if you're, like, you're still living for some other mission, you want your life to matter. You want there to be purpose. You want there to be significance. You want to wake up in the morning and have some reason to run. But you can't run after a mission you don't understand. So this morning we're going to walk through the Great Commission together. It's word by word almost. Just reminding ourselves, like inviting ourselves back in this one mission that Jesus left us with. All four of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and the book of Acts, they all record like a, a version of this commissioning of Jesus. But we call the one in Matthew, we call that one the Great Commission. We'll pick up in Matthew 28, verse 16, if you got a copy of God's word. Matthew 28, verse 16. I know you got a lot of, you got 18 through 20 memorized. You don't have 16 and 17 memorized, so we're going to start back here, all right? A little bit, little bit new for you, all right? Matthew 28, 16. It says this, it says, now the 11 disciples, they went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. All right, so we've been walking through a series called The Whole Story. Uh, we started in Genesis. We've been walking our way all the way forward. We've, we've covered the life of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus. We, like, we covered the resurrection of Jesus. We covered the doubt like, of, of Thomas and Jesus showing up at his disciples and opening the word on the road to Emmaus, like explaining this, I am the fulfillment of everything that came before. I'm the king of kings and lord of lords. I'm the great high priest. I'm the eternal king. Like, I'm, I'm it. Right? And it's about time for him to ascend to the Father. Last few moments on earth with these disciples. 
calls him up to the mountain to which he directed him. He's already done all of it. He's already accomplished all of it. He's got a sacrificial lamb, the great high priest. He, like, think about this. The one that they're standing in front of now, they are completely clear, is the one. When they come up on that hill and there's Jesus and he's going to speak to them, he's speaking to them in light of the fulfillment of everything that we've studied the last, I don't even know how long, been, like, I don't know, 30-something, 40-something, I don't know, long time, right? The one who's fulfilled all. King of kings, Lord of the, like the son of God standing there with them. Like the weight of who he is informs what he says. They're on the Mount of Olives. It's the end, right? Verse 17, it says this. It says when they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. The word there, like the, the, in the original language, it's, it's, there's a, it's, it's a hesitation. It's not a like, full doubt of validity. It's a, it's a he- I, I don't know if I want to be a part of this. Right? Like there's, there's a hesitation. Even there, as there are in a lot of us, when you encounter Jesus, you start encountering his mission. There's this like, hesit- ooh, that's a high bar. And this is what he said, the last words he would utter to his followers, in light of all that he'd fulfilled, in light of what he'd accomplished, like, this is what he says. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Starts in verse 18 and he makes this really bold claim. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. That's a bold claim. All authority in heaven and earth is all mine. All right. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. In light of the fulfillment of everything, in light of the promises that began in Genesis 3, like in light of, like, of who I am, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He answers four questions about his authority. By the way, we got to go quick. I want to talk. I got to talk about the Great Commission a long time. Um, we got to go quick, all right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be running through this pretty fast. Uh, I want you to write some stuff down. Uh, you need to take some notes, like, because you ain't going to remember all this. I, yeah, I, I couldn't either, all right? So he answers four questions about his authority in that one sentence. First, how much authority does Jesus have? All. How much authority does Jesus have? Like in, in the world, in your life, in my life, like how, how much authority is, is he due? All of it. The, like the word there, like is, is pos. It means to the fullest extent or quantity. There is no authority left that Jesus does not possess. He has it all. You may not be living under that authority. You may be trying to like strain against that authority, but it's still his authority. All right, you can live in disobedience to an authority, but it's still, he's the authority. All. What kind of authority does he have? The word he uses here is, 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 a, is a really interesting word. It means power in legitimate hands. What kind of authority? He has, he has authorized legitimate authority. There can be a lot of other authorities that can claim authority. They're not the legitimate authority. When you watch a football game, you can say a pass is complete. It does not matter what you think about that, right? No one cares. There's a legitimate authority on the field, right? Wearing the little stripes, you know? They are the legitimate authority and no one cares what you think. You're not the authority. You're an illegitimate authority. There's an, a legitimate authority. Jesus says all like legitimate, real authority in heaven and on earth. Like it's mine. Where does he exercise his authority? In heaven and on earth. It's not confined. It's not just in heaven, like he's in charge of, you know, that kind of stuff. And where the earth is kind of up to you. You can do what you, you do you, right? That's not what he's saying. In heaven and on earth. Heaven is not just heavenly bodies. That's over spiritual beings. That's like stuff you don't even see. All right? And then earth is not just physical earth, but you and me, every one of us. He says, I hold authority over all of it. I hold ultimate, legitimate authority in all places over all things. And then he says this, where did, where did he get it? He says, it's been given to me by the Father, like the creator of all things. Like he's like, the, the Father's given me this authority, all authority in heaven and on earth. Like the one true God, all that belongs to Jesus. That's what he claims about himself. Now let me ask you a question. That sentence answers four, but let me ask you a question. 
who is your greatest authority right now? Who's your greatest authority? Who's, whose authority are you living in? Who or what gets to tell you what to do and you drop everything and you do that? Right? Like who, 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 who gets to say, hey man, this is what you need to be doing. I wanna see this and like, and you're gonna do it. Doesn't matter what anybody else says. They are like, who's your highest authority? For some of you, it might be your boss, it might be your parents. For some of you, it's your spouse. It's weird. For some of you, it's your, it's your coach. For some of you, it's your kid's coach. They say, you're going to be there, you're going to be there. You're going to change this, you're going to change that. You're going to spend this, you spend it. For some of you, it's just, it's, it's, it's you. You're trying to be all authority in heaven and on earth. And you've given it to you. You're supposed to be the one in charge. And it doesn't matter what anybody else says. It doesn't matter what anybody else would speak into that. You are trying, you're just going to, you have your own mission and you're going to walk it out. You don't care what anybody else has to say about that. I do what I want. Now, whose authority do you ignore? Who's, who's like, like, cause those, those aren't real authorities, are they? The authorities that you ignore, that you pass over, you're like, okay, I hear you, I'm not gonna do it, all right? Jesus just claimed all authority in heaven on earth. So let me ask you, like, does the authority of Christ carry more weight than the authorities of this world for you? Does the authority of Christ carry more weight than the authority, like your bosses, your spouse, coaches, yourself, whose authority carries the most weight? Like, is it Jesus or like, do you find yourself honestly kind of ignoring his authority and following yourself and someone else? That's where a lot of us land. We're following a pattern and a, a thing that somebody else set up for us. And that it's, it's it, like, a lot of you are, like, a lot of us follow the plans for our life we made when we were like seven. I'm going to be an astronaut. And you like been running after it ever since. Who's the authority in your life? Who's in charge here? Because Jesus starts out with the Great Commission and says, like, hey, if, you, if you're going to be a part of the mission, you've got to recognize that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, not you. Are you as committed to carrying out the mission of Christ as you are about going to work tomorrow? Are you, are you as passionate about carrying out the mission of Christ as you are about getting your career started? Or elevating your career? Like, are, are you as committed, like, is it an unquestionable given that you're going to be about his mission tomorrow? Are you as submitted to Christ as you, are you as submitted to Christ as you are yourself, your boss, your family? The authorities that you ignore are not authorities in your life. And before you would say, no, man, I'm, I'm, I'm just the authority of my life. Like, I, I would, I'm, I'm all about it. Like, before you, like, cut me off and, like, don't hear that some other authorities are probably crushing in a little bit, like, just ask yourself, like, before, How's your time in the Word? <laughs> if He's the authority in your life, like and not, I'm not spending any time in the, in the Word. Like, <laughs> how's, how's how's your how's it going sharing your faith? Because the missions make disciples. How's it going sharing your faith? How, how's where's where's most of your time go? Where's where's your energy and your focus? Where's your money spent? Whose mission are you really living for? For us to be people that fulfill the mission, Jesus has to become our highest authority. Theologian H.B. Charles, he said, said this is on the screen. He said, if, if verse 18 is not true, verses 19 and 20 are meaningless. So we got to wrestle with 18 first. All right? You got to make it past 18. All right, but if you make that leap, you put Christ on the throne, he's the authority in your lives. What do you do? He gives you the mission in 19. Verse 19, he says this, go, therefore, make disciples, all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach and observe everything I've commanded you. Let's take that apart. First, he says, therefore, in light of what he just said, in light of that authority piece, in light of who he is, what he's done, in light of his authority, including like all, overall things, including you, go and make disciples. He says, therefore, in light of my authority, this is what you're called to do, go and make disciples. That's the big reveal. That's the big reveal. That's the mission. That's the purpose. That's the calling for every believer that's ever lived. Like this is it. What's your purpose in Christ? Go and make disciples. What does Jesus ask, to ask those of us who have trusted him as Savior, what does he ask us to go do? Go and make disciples. In light of the authority that Jesus has in my life, what am I supposed to do? Make disciples. What am I going to do with my future? Make disciples. Like, like it's, it's just, that's it. 
As a teacher, what am I supposed to do? Make disciples. As a parent, what am I supposed to do? Make disciples. As a college kid or a high school student, as a grandparent, what am I supposed to do with my life? Make disciples. Be incredible at those things. Be the most ballin' astrophysicist in the world, like, right? Make disciples. Now, hang on, I don't think you, I don't, I don't think you heard me. Like, making disciples is not an additional task. I think what we hear a lot is that the Great Commission is something to be bolted on to the rest of life, added on as an additional task. And okay, I got to do this. I got to get the dishes. I got to do this. I, you know, I got to, you know, whatever. And I got to just make disciples. And, you know, no, he's not adding an additional task here. He, he's changing the mission. Mission dictates task. All right? Think about that. Mission dictates task. If you're connected to Bama's football team, you have a mission. Beat everyone, right? It's, just, it's easy. Win. It's easy. Everybody's clear on it. Nobody's like, I don't. What are we here for, really? You know, what are we here? No, nobody's. Nobody asks. Win. We just know. Win. If you're a, if you're a part of the team, you're connected to the team. If you're a booster for the team. If you like live in the state, the mission is we win. If you work there, like everything that you do, like in day to day, if you're a player there, everything you do day to day is supposed to align. Every task that's a part of this should align with this mission of win. You don't get to do things that don't align with win, right? Like mission dictates task. The thing you do day in day aligns with your mission. If your mission is to pursue your happiness above all else and to secure that for yourself for all time, right? If your mission is your happiness, it dictates what you do day to day. If your mission is to amass wealth, to like build security, to build ease for yourself, to build comfort for yourself, then that dictates the tasks that you undertake in a day-to-day to accomplish your mission. If your mission is to keep other people happy and to people please everyone and make sure everybody else around you, you know, like you fulfill their expectations, then that dictates your task. That dictates what you do. Mission dictates task. And then Jesus shows up and says, now I'm going to change the mission the mission is to go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe everything I've commanded you. Every task, everything that we do, if you're a believer, you fall into that mission, everything, it, every task is supposed to align with that mission. You know, you can have some side quests, you can have some other things that, like, yeah, that you're passionate about and you're pursuing, and yeah, then you should pour yourself into those things aligned with the mission. Your role in your career does not get to be misaligned with the mission. Your, your, which, how you parent doesn't get to be misaligned with the mission. It all falls under the mission. So what's yours? Like, what are you driving at? What are you living for? What's dictating how you live your life today and tomorrow, the decade to come? What mission are you, at? like, be honest about it with yourself. Like, what mission are you actually living for? And does it matter? In light of his authority, does it matter? He's given us a mission. Everything we do is just line up under that. Now, let's, let's do a little bit of grammar here. Let's go back to the passage. It says there's, there's, there's only one command in this passage. kind of looks like go is one and make disciples is another. It's not. There's, make disciples is the only command in this, in this statement, all right? The others are, 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 are passive participles. So it's, it's really like there's three modifiers. There's going, baptizing, teaching. Those are modifying how we make disciples. That, that go right there is really going. So another way to read it is like, as you are going, make disciples. So think about that, like as you're going. It's not like a command like you got to go somewhere or whatever. Like, it's just like as you are going about your day-to-day life, make disciples. It implies like there's a manner of life that we walk this out in. So in every area. In our city, in our campus, in our world, wherever it is that we are, like we are to be people who are making disciples as you go. It's not something we, we separate off and we say, okay, well, this summer I'm going to go on mission. I'm going to go make disciples in a different place. I'm going to come back here. I'm going to do me for the next nine months. That's not how this works. It's not, okay, at a different season, when my kids get a little bit older and life slows down or whatever, then I'm going to get to make disciples. But right now I've just got to huddle up. i got to take, no, like, Make disciples. Disciple your, your kids. Like, they're there. Like, that, make disciples is the mission. As you go. Not later. Not in the past. As you're living your life. 
right, let's make sure we're exactly clear on what it means to make disciples. This part's mean, to be honest with you. This part's stung. All right, listen, a disciple, when it says make disciples, you got to know what you're making, right? You know what a disciple is, and you can't make one. <laughs> yeah, so it's like Lego sets with no instructions. It doesn't, it you just, you, it's always ends up being a house. You know, it's, it's, uh, so what are we making? Because listen, like a disciple, when you start reading scripture, a disciple's more uh, than someone, it's, there's something additional to someone who has placed their faith in Jesus. Someone who has just placed their faith in, in Jesus is, is not, by the scripture's definitions, is, is not a fully formed disciple yet. They're a believer. They've, they've come to a point, they trusted Jesus as their savior. They haven't, they're, not, they're, not, they're not a disciple. Jesus is talking to the disciples. He's telling the disciples what their mission is. The disciples are the ones who walk out the mission. Believers are the ones who have trusted their eternity to Jesus and haven't gotten that far yet. I meet people a lot who have been believers for decades. But they're not disciples. They're not disciple makers. Believer is the starting point. When you trust your faith and like trust yourself to Jesus, like trust in the cross and the resurrection, like asking Jesus to save you, that, that makes you, like I, I believe. But then Jesus invites those believers to be a part of his mission and he calls those people disciples. Disciples don't just believe in Jesus, they're following him with their lives, leading other people to do the same. Following with their lives and, and, and leading other people to do the same. Now, the way that you do that is, you know, can whatever. Like, that is, is, there's, there's different ways to do that. But, like, people who are disciples are helping other people follow Jesus. So let me ask you about this progression, okay? Let's, I just want you to, nobody's going to, like, there's no test or whatever. But just think about this. Now, there's a three-part progression. I'm going to stick on the screen, all right? And I, I want you to just be honest about where you think you fall on that. So the first one on the progression is, is secret. A seeker is somebody who's interested in the gospel. They're interested in trying to figure out Christianity. They're not convinced of it yet. They're with Thomas. They got some doubts, and they, they, you have questions. We've talked about that. Like, we honor the fact that people are here, people are engaging, trying to figure this stuff out. It's a great place to be. But at the point that you get those things figured out, and you're able to put your faith and trust in Jesus, that makes you a believer. Like, Jesus, I believe. I want you to save me. Like, take away my sin. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm in. I mean, you believe her. That's a starting point. What you see in scripture is that people that came to know Jesus, they, they are discipled. They're invested in that teaching them to deserve all of the communities. Like that happens for them. And then, then it replicates. Well, they become disciple makers. They're doing the thing. They're in, engaged in the mission. Uh, simply disciples are disciple makers. Disciples are disciple makers. So where are you on that? Like, that, honestly, that can burn your pride a little bit. Like, Britton, you're telling me I've been, a, I've been a believer 10 years, and I was a believer a long time before I was a disciple. And no one told me. I didn't pick that up from going to church, right? I was disciple. I had a lot of people who were wanting to, like, pour into me. Hey, do you want to come to my Bible study? Yeah. You want to come to my Bible study? Sure. You want to come out? Yeah, I'm going to all the Bible studies, right? And, like, is this what I'm supposed to do as a Christian, just go to your thing? No. Be discipled and then make disciples. David Platt says it like this. He says, according to Jesus, from beginning to end, to be a disciple is to make disciples. Whew. Scripture knows nothing of a disciple, uh, knows nothing of disciples who aren't making disciples. No one told me that. Nobody modeled that for me. No one set that before me. So I, I just was trying to, I don't know, figure it out. I'm just like, all right, I guess I'm supposed to just do less bad things, do more good things, go to church, I don't know, help out, stack some chairs and like, I guess that's it. No, that ain't it. The mission is it. We started at Oaks to be a church that sends disciple makers of Jesus by being disciple makers of Jesus to live out the mission. We didn't want to build a big crowd of people in a room. I come listen to me. I'm an introvert. I don't even like that. Like, I, I, I want to, like, you back row people, like, we should hang at a distance. Like, that's, that's where I want to be. 
We didn't try to start a church where we were going like, to distort the gospel and make it easy and entertaining so we can pack as many people in the places we could and be proud of ourselves. We wanted to proclaim Christ. We wanted to disciple new believers. We wanted to send them out, release, like equip them and release them to go into the grand adventure of the mission of God. And if you're in that middle space, a believer, that's a beautiful place to be. To be discipled. To the point that you're ready to step into the mission and be a disciple maker. Next, he says, make disciples of all nations. I got to go quick, y'all. Uh, when we, we talk about all nations a lot. Like, it's a core conviction of our church that, that disciples need to be made in every corner of our city, every neighborhood, every nation. Like, it's, it's who we are about. When he says all nations, it doesn't mean physical, like, nations. It means all people groups. You can probably identify a lot of people groups in your city. We talk about UPGs, unreached people groups around our world, 7,000 plus unreached people groups with no access to the gospel. We talk about them. But there's also people on your street. There's people across town. There's people like in your home who have not internalized the gospel. There's also structures and systems and leadership of the world. Like that, that, that there's, there's, when it says all nations, it means all. And there is no hierarchy to that. There's no hierarchy of calling in that. If God calls you to the nations, great. If God calls you to your neighbor, fantastic. There's no hierarchy. We're not trying to scale a ladder or something, all right? It's as you go. Wherever it is, he calls you. And if that's Atlanta, make disciples in Atlanta. If it's Tuscaloosa, make disciples in Tuscaloosa. If it's some country you never heard of, make disciples. We go, wherever he leads, we go. So he says, all, make disciples of all nations. Next, he says, we should be baptizing those disciples, those, those new believers, those people who have trusted their faith in Jesus. He says, we should be baptizing those. Now, we talked about this just a couple of weeks ago. We covered Jesus' baptism. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You can go back just a few weeks in the podcast or YouTube or whatever and, and find, find the whole thing. Talked about it forever, okay? But I'll be brief. The meaning of the word in baptism is baptizo. It literally means to immerse. You see that happening in Mark 1, Jesus' baptism. He's, he's immersed by John the Baptist. And you see people, like, from then on, like, being immersed in water as a, as a, as a public profession of their faith in the person of Jesus. Every re reference you see in the New Testament in Christian baptism follows someone's salvation. They've chosen to be a believer. They've chosen to trust in Jesus, and they've made that public in baptism. Scripture, we see seekers becoming believers, believers being baptized. So that, at our church, that's the way we do that because that's what we see in Scripture. So we're supposed to <laughs> help these people come to be believers and then help them follow through in baptism, all right? Next, just, Jesus describes the way that, that baptism like, shows the significance of it. He says, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what you're identifying yourself with in baptism. That's like who, if you've been baptized, like if you're, if you're a Christian, you've been identified with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit kind of marks you. This is our, it's a way of publicly declaring your faith and saying, it's, it's always really, we don't do it like super private. We ain't baptizing people in bathtubs and stuff. Like, like some, no, it's in front of people. There's something to that, of publicly identifying yourself with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's a hurdle to baptism. There really is, and I get that. I think that's on purpose. I think there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a reason that there's a hurdle to step over and say, like, do you want to publicly be identified with the gospel, or is this something that you're trying to hide away? Because you can't be a part of the mission trying to hide away your identif identification with Christ. So it says, I'm going to step up. It's a little nerve-wracking, right? But you also got to remember, like, in, in the first century when they were doing this, they, there weren't like, horse troughs in pretty rooms. And so that's what ours is, is a horse trough, by the way. Somebody missed that reference a few weeks ago. Um, we just bought a horse trough from, like, a Harbor Freight or something. It's great. It works good. Um, they didn't have that. Theirs was in, like, public waterways. And so if you're identified with Christ, if you're marked as a Christian through baptism, then your whole city saw it. At risk of your life sometimes. There are people now being baptized all over the world in other nations at risk of their life to be publicly identified with Jesus. There's a hurdle. It's on purpose. I had a friend of mine, he was pushing 30. He was a, it's not, it's not here, it's the last church we were at. And uh, he, was a, he was in our band, man, like he was serving, he was leading groups. Um, and one day he kind of awkwardly came up to me and he's like, Britton, like, can we talk about something? I'm like, yeah, man. 
So he sat down and he said, hey, look, I, I feel real embarrassed about this, but I, I got baptized when I was a little kid uh, because my brother did. I didn't understand the gospel. I wasn't trying to follow Jesus. Uh, I literally like, remember knowing that I didn't believe it. Um, and I, I've just not told anybody about that for like the last 20 something years. Uh, and it's been gnawing at me. What do you think about me being baptized? Like, do you think it would, he said, do you think it would cause anybody else to stumble? Like their small group leader hadn't, been, you know, whatever, hadn't been baptized, a guy in the band. Hadn't, I'm like, nah, man, we need to tell that story. And so I got to baptize a friend of mine who'd been a believer for a long time, but had gotten baptized prior to trusting Jesus. It's a powerful testimony. But there was a barrier there for him, right? It's almost like, he, I mean, I, did, I, don't, I don't think he needed to be embarrassed, but he felt like he, felt like he was. I don't think you ought to be embarrassed to be identified with Jesus. I don't care how that story goes. Jesus paid for your life with his blood on a cross, and when you've trusted that sacrifice, he calls you to let the world know through baptism. I'll stop talking about baptism. I can do that all day too. All right, so next, verse 20. It says, it says, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Teaching, that's that third word in the passage explaining how to live it out. Going, baptizing, teaching. Going, baptizing, teaching. All right, so teaching implies that learning is supposed to happen. How do you learn worst? You know how I learn worst? Sitting in a big room with somebody talking to me for half an hour. That's how I learn worst. Look, like I'm sitting in your seat. I'm having the hardest time paying attention. I don't care what's going on. I mean, you can do cartwheels up here, and I'm like, I really need to think about my grocery list right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just, I, this is how I learn worst. If this is how we do the Great Commission, the teaching element of the Great Commission, then whew, we're in trouble. How do I learn best? I learn best hands-on with somebody. If I can go do it with you, and you can talk about it, you can like help me unpack. No, 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 don't do it like that, right? Like, I, I can pick things up pretty quick. If we can go hands-on while you're teaching me, walking alongside with somebody. Think about how Jesus taught his disciples to follow him. Not the crowds, think about the disciples. It wasn't in 30 minute monologues once a week. It was life on life. Meeting together, talking together, like unpacking things together, but also just seeing the way he lived his life. He spent time with them, explained things, showed them how he modeled it. And then like sent them to go try it on their own. Then they came back from trying it on their own, they debriefed it and he's like, how'd it go? Sent them out again, a few more people, and brought them back. Okay, how'd it go? Like they're, they're learning to do it themselves from him. That's how we teach others to follow Jesus. We spend time with them. We open the word with them, not just explain it to them. Like we help them to figure out how to handle it themselves. I just listen to a leader. Leaders are showing and modeling and encouraging and exhorting to the point that you can do that work as well. That mission takes time. And if you want to be a part of it, you got to make some time. That's what we're supposed to be doing as individuals. Like, like that's why we do tribe and huddles. The main way discipleship happens in our church is through huddle, where one person is meeting with just three, maybe four other people once a week, opening the word, saying, okay, we've talked about how to study the Bible, how to get something out of that. Like, tell me what you got out of it. Okay, like, all right, that was... A little left field. So let's figure out how to work on it. All right, like, all right, so like this, now we're going to talk about how to pray together. Let's talk about what are you praying for? Who are you praying for? How do you do that? That's huddle. Somebody helping some other people get those foundational disciplines set up in place. It's not the only way to make disciples, but it's the primary way that we do that at Oaks. The primary way that we make community happen is through tribe. Where a few people are hosting tribe and they're saying, you come over to the house, we're going to try to unpack the sermon. The 80% of Britain's thing that you've completely forgot about, we'll kind of put some pieces back together on that. We're going to hang out and have a good spiritual conversation. We'll have some, some godly friends that you can ask questions of together. Like they're making community happen with the intent for both tribe and huddle that those people then can step out of those things as the Lord leads to make those things happen for someone else. Not to take care of you forever. Not to be discipled forever. The end point of the mission is, is not just, you know, for you to have somebody to take care of you forever. That's not the goal. The mission is not go and be discipled. 
is it? The mission is go and make disciples. And so a lot of you, maybe you're in a season that you're being disciples, you're getting those foundational like, you know, pieces in place. Soon, I'm, I'm praying that there comes a day when you're like ready to step up into that thing and say, okay, I, I've got enough I can go pour into somebody else. I don't have all the answers. I don't know all the things. I don't either. But I got enough that I can pour into somebody else. And so when I was 18 years old, somebody gave me some seventh graders and they're like, I don't know, man, do your best. I still talk to some of those seventh graders. One of them goes to our church. It mattered. I didn't know what I was doing. There was no training at all. It was like, just go sit in this room. I don't know. Here's a Bible. Best of luck, my friend. We ain't going to do that to you. But at a certain point, it's going to say, listen, like you've been discipled. You don't know everything, but you know enough. Are you ready to start pouring that into somebody else? All right. Finally, Jesus closes with a promise. Verse 28, uh, 20, Matthew 28, 20, the end of it, he says, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. You know, I love that Jesus doesn't just stop with I'm with you. Lots of people have promised to be with you, right? Lots of people have promised to walk with you, be by your side, you know, and they weren't. There's something that wonders about the Lord sometimes, like, is he really going to be with me always? There's this promise that comes alongside the mission, like, hey, I know I'm, I'm calling you up to be a part of something that's terrifying, that you will not feel ever feel fully equipped for, that you won't feel worthy of. Like, there's, that's, this is going to be a high bar, but I'm going to be with you in it always to the end of the age. For those who trust him, let him save him, who are his. He's never going to abandon you. As you step into the mission to try to be a disciple maker and try to pour into somebody else, knowing that there's going to be questions that come, and that scares you to not have a good answer. There's awkward things that you're just, like, assuming are going to happen. Usually they don't, right? Like, I'm with you. There's a promise to that. It gives us the spirit to God to encourage, to empower us to do things beyond ourselves. I think some of the times the reason we don't get to, you don't, maybe don't experience all the spirits because you're not doing anything that you need him for. For this mission, you do. So when the power of the Spirit step into the mission, be a part of this grand thing that Jesus has called us to, leaning on his authority, leaning on his promise to be with you, to just simply just go and give to other people what someone's given to you. It is that profound and that simple. I want to live my life for something beyond me. I want to be a part of movement of God, not a movement of man. God like, changed my life by saving me. He changed the way I live my life when some people decided to pour into me, disciple me. But the, the, the time that I grew the most is when I stepped into the mission, started trying to disciple some other people. That's when I grew, when I had to start learning more to give it away. Do you want to be a part of a movement of God that shakes eternity? I do. I don't want to watch some other people do that. I want to be a part of a movement of God that shakes eternity. Do you want to be a part of that? And step into the mission. Don't watch it from the sideline. As I bring our time to a close, I just want to bring you back to that little progression, that, that, that threefold progression of seeker, believer, disciple. You thought about that earlier, right? You kind of know where you are in that. And so I just want to talk to each one of those three groups of people. Right? So if you're a seeker, listen, like, here's my challenge to you. Will you just ask the questions that are on your mind? Don't trust, the, like, don't trust the, your brain to like tell you what's true or not. But like, would you just would you ask somebody else, like, hey, tell me what you think about this? How does this work? Like, would you ask the questions? Would you be willing to read the Bible with someone who's maybe spent a little bit more time with it than you have, so you can ask questions of the Bible, not a person? None of these people in here are the authority. All authority in heaven and earth is His. It's not theirs. So one of the best ways to figure this stuff out is to sit down with somebody and say, hey can we read some of this together and like we just talk about it? So the way that we do that is we normally, we read through the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Matthew, one of those. Sometimes the Gospel of John is kind of long. We read it out loud, paragraph by paragraph, and then like, all right, there's the paragraph. What in there didn't make sense? And you just get to ask questions. And they're just trying to help out of what God's given them. Would you ever doing that? If somebody invited you this morning, or like, come meet me, man. I'm not reading with anybody right now. Like, like, 
Just ask. If you're a seeker, would you seek well? And if you're a believer, man, I'm thankful to God that you trusted Christ as your Savior. I don't care if you've been on this stage 20 minutes, 20 years, but like that's a in, in beautiful, incredible place to be. But if you've never been discipled, that's your next step. If you've never been discipled, like somebody's opened the word with you and helped you figure out how to study it for yourself, how to glean from it, like how to lean into it on your own and develop a prayer life and develop some of these spiritual disciplines to feed yourself, like that's your next step. You need to be discipled. Next semester, you need to jump in a huddle and like walk with somebody, like actually show up, avail yourself, like do not miss it. Like be there every single week. I don't care what's happening. Be there and invest yourself in that. And it's like figure out how to follow Jesus and let them help you. Be discipled. And then next, start praying about is it time for me to step up and be a disciple maker? If you've been in a huddle, if you've been in tribe, like if, if you're ready to like step up and you're seeing this in the mission, like there's a call here, not for me to be taken care of, for me to step up and lead these things. Like, what are you going to do with that? I know you're scared. I've talked to so many people this semester. This is weird about this semester. I've talked to so many people who tell me like, man, I've been in huddle for like a year, year and a half, been in tribe like two years, and I'm just scared. Oh, dude, okay, look, like the first people we started tribe with, they went to tribe once and then COVID hit and they didn't go to tribe ever again. We're just like, all right, look, the general is sort of how it works. Like, all right, we're gonna go meet under trees and have tribe. And it was great. They didn't know what they were doing, but they knew how to hang out with people, right? The first people that stepped up and led huddles outside of me and Austin and Jessica and Emily, we, we huddled them on Zoom in the summer of 2020. That was their great experience of huddle. Didn't see each other face to face once. And 13 of them rolled out and like, all right, I think I got it. Basically, we open the word, we do hear journals together, pray together a little bit, do some prayer requests, back each other up, got it. And 13 people rolled out and started huddles. And there was over 100, 100 huddles this semester because somebody said yes, fear and all. Next week, we're going to celebrate that we're graduating out and sending out 30, 40, 50 uh, of our members as graduates. Most of them are leaving our city. They're going to go make disciples of all nations. And they're going to leave a space for you. If you've been discipled, if you're at that believer level, you've been discipled, is it time for you to step up and make disciples? And lastly, disciple makers, man, I see what you're doing through Oaks. I pray every day that God raises up more of you. I don't know that you can see the, the exponential fruit of what God's doing through your acts of faithfulness. I know sometimes tribe and huddle's hard. I know sometimes leading kids ministry and student ministries, and I know all that stuff is difficult, but you're pouring into people. You're doing that work. Their lives are going to be different from that. Like the people that they invest in, they in, in, encounter, and <laughs> you're going to make generational impact through those acts of faithfulness. Don't be discouraged. I know it's the end of the semester. I know time is running short and you're tired. Run the race with perseverance. Our next step seems going to be back there in the back. Our band's going to come, lead us in a time of response. And next step's back there for you. And there's a few opportunities for you to make some next steps. So I, one, you just need to pray about what your next step is. But two, if you're a seeker, if you're in here, man, I, I would love to read, to read with somebody. I'd love to have some questions answered. I'd love to be able to do that. And then those people back there at next steps, they can help you figure that out. And they can also just pray for you. I just want to back you up. They won't, they won't necessarily be the people doing all that work with you. They might be, but they're there to support you and encourage you. So after the service or even during, like when I was our band leads, you can make your way to the back. You can talk to somebody about your questions. You can talk to somebody about next steps about that. For the believers in the room, and if you're, if you're looking for, to be discipled, then there's, we, we, starting next semester, we're gonna be rolling out all kinds of ways for you to step into those spaces. But right now, if God's been laying on your heart to go be a disciple maker, step up and do that work for somebody else, next step's where you need to be. You're gonna talk to one of those folks and say, I'm scared out of my mind about this. Would you pray for me? That God would take away that fear or like I would like, do whatever you need to pray for. Like go, go pray with somebody about that. And then after the service, talk to Dave, talk to me, talk to one of us and say, listen, all right, I think I'm ready to go. And if you're a disciple maker in the room, Maybe you've had a rough go of it with huddle this semester. Maybe you're just tired and worn out. Maybe you're feeling dry and you're trying to pour out of kind of an empty place. Go back there and talk to somebody about that. Just go lay that stuff down. Just go let them pray over you and hug on you. Come back to your seat, all right? I hope there's a line of next steps. I hope there's, uh, you're, you're having to wait back there to set some of those burdens down that are on your heart, okay?
So I'm going to pray. When I say amen, I want you to stand together. And let's go ahead and stand together now. Go ahead and stand together. So I want to pray for you. And then as our band begins to lead, that's your opportunity to go do something about it, okay? Let's pray. Father, um, I'm, I, don't, I don't know why you chose to do this the way you did, why, why you would entrust something so precious as the gospel to people like us. I think you believe in us a lot more than we believe in ourselves. We know that we are completely and wholly insufficient uh, for the task at hand to be disciple makers of Jesus. But you've made us sufficient. You've called us. You've, you're equipping us and by your spirit that you're, you're empowering us. And so God, I pray that just as it took a lot of faith for us to trust you as savior, that it, we would have the faith to trust you as king, to live under your authority above all others, to set aside those authorities as hectic as that might be and to run hard in the one mission that you left us with. God, move us to action. Move us forward in the process. We love you. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen.